Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thanks, David. As we wind down our 2022, our last guest of the year is Danny King, CEO and co-founder of Accredible, a global digital credentialing platform that created digital certificates and badges. Danny founded Accredible in 2012 with Alan Heppenstall with the vision of becoming the world's truly first verifiable repository of human capital. Their vision Their vision is fueled by the belief that individuals should be evaluated holistically, not just by the basic transcripts that higher education institutions currently issue to their graduates. Accredible has the potential to change the scope and function of employer hiring by using technology to create digital transcripts that enable hiring organizations to view a candidate's broad skill set, not just the titles of courses taken in their quest for their degree. This is why they call it credentialing. Danny, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Drum. Really great to be here. Looking forward to having a great conversation with you. I've been looking at your company for quite a while, Accredible. You're doing some amazing things. But before we get started into that, give us a little background about yourself, if you would. Sure, happy to. Um, well, as you can probably hear, I'm uh, English, uh, you know, originally, uh, but I live out here in, in the Bay Area in, in the States, been here for about a decade. And what brought me out here was a couple of things. You know, number one, I fell in love with Silicon Valley, came out here for a startup boot camp, and that, that brought me out here and really fell in love with it. And number two was a sort of a burning passion to try and create a company around education. You know, my my dad, you know, was in education for his whole career. He was, uh, you know, a, a, we call it a headmaster in the UK, but over here a principal. Um, and then he worked in school districts. My mum taught English to immigrants. My brother's a computer science teacher. So I had this education bug bit me early on and this entrepreneurial bug bit me early on. And I think that brought me out here to, uh, to the Bay Area to try and create a company. Some of the best and smartest presidents I know come from industry as entrepreneurs. Mm, absolutely. You know, I think a lot of different professions uh, have very, very entrepreneurially minded people. In fact, you need to be sort of entrepreneurially minded to thrive. I I don't think that, you know, startups have a monopoly on uh, entrepreneurship at all. They shouldn't, but unfortunately, many, many higher education institutions, you know, higher ed's been around for what, a thousand years? Mm -hmm. You know, Cambridge, Oxford, which, you know, you're well familiar with being back from the UK. You know, they've been around years and years and years. And You know, we used to have a saying in the Navy, 275 years of tradition unmarred by progress. And unfortunately, <laughs> I see that a lot in higher ed. It's, you know, status quo, let's not make a lot of changes. But your company's changing that in very important way with issuing credentials. Well, that's right. And, you know, that that sort of natural tension, especially in something like credentials, which are so important, you know, this is not the only output of a university, of course, but it's a major one. It's the it, often the interface that a lot of people have, you know, a lot of recruiters or or hiring managers have with the university is is the credentials. So it makes a lot of sense that folks would be very sort of, I think, the deliberate and thoughtful and careful when trying to innovate around things like credentialing. But I think there's also, you know, it's been wonderful to see how much help pushing against an open door it was to try and create improvements in something as old and entrenched and archaic as credentials. You know, something we joke a little bit about is that sometimes universities still call them sheepskins, you know, because they used to be made on sheepskin probably a thousand years ago. And, you know, I think that that shows how how much tradition is baked into these things. But there is an appetite, I think, to innovate. It just needs to be done carefully in the higher education sector. I think you're absolutely right. And one of the things just so the audience understands when we talk about credentialing, we're not necessarily talking about micro-credentials. We're not talking about certificate programs. What you're talking about actually is transcripts and things along those lines, correct? Well, that's right. I I take a very broad definition of credential. It can be micro-credentials. It can be full-on postgraduate, you know, um, doctorates um, and, and everything in between. 
we as a company, you know, my company are credible, don't sort of define or standardize what you as an organization should be issuing. You get to decide that. For us, it's more, you know, the definition of a credential is an organization vouching for somebody's ability to know something, do something, or has done something. We see it as our job to make it really easy to communicate that to the right stakeholders and make it impossible to have a fraudulent version of that. And and which makes perfect sense. In in the way I think about it, that's the transcript. You know, the, the student, right. the employer wants the transcript. And right now the transcript is just plain vanilla. You know, course name, the course number, maybe. You know, what the uh, the credit hours were and what the grade is in the course. But that really doesn't help an employer know what, in fact, the student actually learned. You've got a great story around this and how you got the idea about a credible. Yeah. So, you know, the, this notion of a, a transcript or a GPA or, you know, the, the heuristics that we use to, and, and let's, let's be clear about what we do, to judge people, to either enable or deny pathways to careers or education, uh, success essentially, is necessary, right? We, we do need a way to quickly, you know, summarize down years and years of achievement um, into something very digestible. But boy, does it miss the mark on a few really important things. And yeah, my, my story of sort of getting into college or, or, or university in the UK sort of is what got us thinking about when I say us, it wasn't just me that started the company. It was my co-founder, Alan Heppenstall. He's our CTO. What got us thinking about credentials in the first place was this story of getting into university. Because I can tell you right now, I did not grow up as a little boy dreaming about creating a credentialing company of all things. We had to be uh, shoved <laughs> really? away into it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, I think there are, we, we talked about entrepreneurship before. I think there are two types of entrepreneur. Um, there are entrepreneurs who start a movement or a company or an initiative because they're really excited about something. And there are entrepreneurs who, who do that because they're really frustrated about something. And I think we were firmly in the latter camp. Yeah, we were excited too. But so yeah, my story of getting into university in the UK, I, I went to a, a beautiful school called Durham University in, in the UK. And I, I just fell in love with this school. It's really beautiful. It's a sort of collegiate university. So it looks, it feels sort of similar to Yale if you you know, for the American audience, if you're familiar with that. Um, one of the one of the colleges within the university you can live in is literally a castle, right? And this castle was built, I think, 800 years ago, you know, and... Wasn't that where Hogwarts or part of Hogwarts for Harry Potter? Exactly. You know, not all of Hogwarts was filmed there, but a lot of the glamour shots of Hogwarts was this, was literally this castle that I was just talking about that, that wow. you can go and live in and study in. And, you know, they wear these gowns and, you know, you have to have all these formal dinners and you kind of look a bit like Harry Potter. And, I just, I just <laughs> fell in love with, with the vibe. Um, it's also a really small university. I think there are, at least when I went, I think there were 16,000 students total. And, you know, just a really small sort of college town vibe. And I loved it. The only problem is, you know, it's considered uh, sort of the equivalent of one of the Ivy Leagues in the UK. It's a really prestigious school. It, it's pretty hard to get into, especially for computer science, which is what I ended up studying. Is where also what my co-founder Alan was studying. That's how we met. And in the UK, um, it's a very different system to applying to university or college. Unlike the US, you know, you can't apply to as many as you want. You, you can only apply to six universities. And it's a sort of government regulated system controlled by the UK Accreditation Service, who, by the way, are a customer now. So that was a nice full circle moment for us. But you, <laughs> the way it works is you apply to six schools and you apply before you get your sort of SAT or AP equivalents. You know, we call them A-levels. And you apply with essentially a rough idea of what you think you'll get in your in your sort of end of end of high school grades. And each school will give you an offer. You know, it's like, okay, well, if you want to come to this school, you need to get straight A's. You know, if you, if you want to come to this school, you can get like two A's and two B's or whatever, right? Now, the school I wanted to go needed straight A's. It's, you know, hard to get into. And here's the thing. I got a D in math. So, you know, this D in math completely prevented my ability to go to the school. There isn't any leeway. You can't, you can't sort of go and petition it. You know, it doesn't work like that. You know, you can only, for example, submit one personal cover letter or statement to all universities, you can't even tailor it to the university. So there is no leeway here. But I just couldn't, I couldn't accept that. I really wanted to go to this school and I ended up getting really lucky. I tracked down who the head of admissions was, um, pleaded with him and, and, and asked him, you know, look, just spend an hour with me and sort of hear my pitch about why I do not think that D in math, even though it's for computer science where math is extremely important, I do not think that D in math is an accurate heuristic for will I be a, a good computer scientist? And I basically, you know, the pitch summarized was, look, I've been coding since I was in diapers. I have been playing with Linux since I was 13. I live and breathe this stuff. I started a little web development company and, and, and made websites for people. You know, 
I think I have what it takes to be a great computer scientist. And I think we can prove everybody wrong that math is an absolute requirement. And if you double click on that math D I got in my, you know, you can think of it as a sort of AP math. Yeah, actually, I was pretty awful at, at most of math. There's a lot of math I really struggled with. But look at these areas where it's directly relevant for computer science. Turns out I'm pretty damn good at those. So, you know, gosh, how bad was I all the other ones, <laughs> you know, if it averaged out at a D. <laughs> but he heard the pitch. Now, that guy was awesome. His name was Brendan Hodgson, and he was retiring that year or the year after, I think. And he decided, I think, to take a risk on me. And what he did was he found a way around this, this government system. He spun up a new course with lower entry requirements with, I think, an application of just one person, let me in, and then on day one, just merged me back into the rest of the computer science school. Now, that D in math said... <laughs> I shouldn't be admitted. And in fact, what happened was I graduated top of the class. In fact, I actually beat all the previous records of grades for the previous decade. So it was this wake-up moment, I think, for everybody around us where it was, it was very clear that we need a more accurate, higher resolution way to say, hey, this is what this person can do, and this is why you should take a bet on them. Mm -hmm. That is a fascinating story. And it really gave rise to what you do at a credible. I mean, and you've been very successful thus far. Last year, you issued over 20 million credentials, 53 million over the total for the company. And your, your client list is, frankly, it's a who's who of higher education, uh, MIT, Harvard, Berkeley, NYU, Oxford, Cambridge. How does this work? You know, what you've taken is what we call over here the transcript and you've personalized it and you've made it far more detailed so that people who are requiring a transcript, whether it be a graduate school, whether it be an employer, whatever, can actually see what a student's learned. Tell us about that, if you would. Yeah. And um, by the way, thank you very much for your kind words. You know, we're really proud of all the customers we've got and all the credentials we've issued. And, and as you can imagine, in the early days, it was very hard to convince folks not only to digitize their credentials, but to rely on a tiny little company that at the time, you know, could die any minute, right? That's what startups are. And, and nowadays, obviously, we're, we're a decade in, we're you know much bigger and don't have those kind of fears anymore. But getting folks to think about and innovate around credentialing was simultaneously, everyone wanted it, but no one wanted to be the first to do it. So yeah, getting those flagship customers, I think, really, really helped to sort of create the avalanche that we're seeing now. So this is how it works. You know, um, we work with organizations that issue credentials. Those are our customers. You know, a lot of them are folks like universities. Some of them are, you know, tech companies like Google, they issue credentials. Some of them are professional associations like the CFP board or IEEE. But the thing they all have in common is they want to issue credentials to people. And a credential can be, like we said before, pretty much anything that they, they deem is appropriate. We're not doing any of the testing or verification of that, you're still doing that. We're, we're the, the folks that you use instead of a print shop or next, you know, in line with your print shop to actually deliver the credential pe to people and make sure that everyone knows what this means. But like you say, on the credential itself, we put a lot of time and thought and energy into making it have a lot more metadata than just a name and a grade, you know, and, and, or, or, or a transcript list, which was in multiple grades. So for example, you might receive a digital credential from, you know, maybe it's Kaplan University, maybe it's MIT. And on there, you know, you'll, you'll go on and it's, it's, a, it's a URL. It's just a little website. Each credential you issue has a unique URL and people put it on their LinkedIn profile or in their email signature or wherever. And the first thing you see is exactly what you're used to seeing, right? It's the certificate with the swirly borders and the signatures and it doesn't confuse anybody, right? You don't need to <laughs> learn something new to use it. Um, but then you scroll down and then at the bottom underneath the credential, the organizations can choose what, what extra information they think will help each student shine. So one of the big problems with credentialing, and you mentioned this before in the transcript, and my story was sort of part of this, is it does not do justice to individuals because we essentially have to average and summarize you. And two people can have identical looking credentials, but have very, very, very different skill sets. Alan, my co-founder and CTO, got very similar grades to me, actually. We have what looks like an identical credential and we have opposite skill sets. I'm the CEO, he's the CTO for a reason. So one of the first things we let folks do is personalize each credential. Some folks... Uh, you know, when I say folks, I mean organizations like universities might decide to let their students upload a portfolio of their work that they did over the three or four year degree they did, showing what they were interested in and passionate about. Others might provide things like syllabuses, or they might provide things like contextual information about what each course, you know, what skills they tagged for each courses that we can guarantee that these students have. Others might include things like extracurricular activities. And some even do things like 
we help them to gather data on things like, what is the median salary for somebody with this credential in this geographic area? How many open jobs are there available for this credential? And that's not necessarily just for the individual receiving the credential. It's also for their friends who are looking at their credentials and thinking, hmm, maybe I should actually consider taking this specialization credential, or maybe I should consider going into this undergraduate degree. So we try and put as much metadata as we can on the credentials so that it's not a one size fits all grade or credential, although it does have that backwards compatibility of things like the GPAs and the transcripts, but also has a much more individualized narrative about what this student or this you know employee wants to be able to communicate and showcase about what they in particular can bring to your organization. Yeah, that is really interesting to me because here you've got this URL that you issue. Mm -hmm. The student is the one who controls it. They, they don't have to go out to the university to get their transcript every time somebody wants it. They've got this URL and it's not hackable. Well, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are different ways to secure it. You can use things like blockchain technology to secure it, or you don't need to do that. The idea being that, hey, if you, if you want to call the university to verify a credential, great. In fact, some universities prefer that and, and they sort of make it so that you have to go and talk to them to verify it. But most would rather you just click a little button and it goes and checks our servers, it goes and checks the customer servers, and it says, yep, this looks good. No, no tampering here. This is still a valid credential, hasn't expired. You know, and that's all you need. Uh, and that should just be a click of a button on the credential itself. And, th and that's one of the big things that we help our customers to do. Yeah. Well, one of the big collateral expenses that universities have is a registrar function, which is mm. absolutely necessary. Being yeah. able to compile student records, you know, doing degree audits, all of the things that the registrar does. But a big portion of their business is the issuing of transcripts. And now, it sounds like what you've done at Accredible is you've taken that to the next level to where you they're not doing that much issuing of transcripts. The students control that. Is that is that a fair statement? Uh, that's correct. Well, I, well, semi-correct. The, the university still essentially control the transcripts, and they have the ability to update them, modify them if there was any issue. And by the way, uh, updating credentials, it, it doesn't just have to go to the transcript. What happens when somebody gets married and their name changes, or maybe they change their name for some other reason? You know? And then all of a sudden, you know, it, it's actually kind of difficult to verify people's credentials. And so th credentials should be updatable. And, and the updatable part, of course, needs to be controlled by the institution. But the individual has a lot more freedom to, you know, with very low friction, put this in front of a stakeholder and have that stakeholder feel immediately trusting of that credential. And if they don't want to use, you know, it's as simple as clicking on a button. But if they don't want to use that, of course, they can still fall back on the sort of, you know, more traditional method. The only sort of pushback I ever see against that is occasionally some universities use that as a profit center where they might charge for a verification. And so they might want to disable that. So, you know, there is a lot of flexibility on how different folks do it. But most organizations don't look at it that way. Most are there as a service to make their students look verified as quickly as possible and to not let people masquerade as being falsely verified, which, by the way, is probably, you know, much more serious and sort of widespread than people realize is, is actually credential fraud. Oh, yeah. And we were talking about this yesterday, and you mentioned to me some statistics from ADP doing background checks that literally blew my mind. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... I think it blows most people's mind when, it, when I tell them this. So, you know, for those who don't know, ADP is a, a very large payroll processing company. So, you know, companies like mine, for example, might pay ADP to handle payroll for people, and they handle about a sixth of all Americans' payroll. They also, though, have a background checking arm. You pay folks to maybe in the, in the interview process to just make sure that their credentials are legitimate and so on. And, you know, what, what we sort of found was um, they publish these studies every year about what they see in these uh, verification checks on these background checks. And ADP found that out of 2.6 million background checks done, I think this was in 2018, 41% of resumes submitted to a background check were found to have a lie about their education. And 23% of credentials were just false. So that's at least two orders of magnitude more than I, I think most people expect. You know, So half the data we're looking at, almost, is flawed, and a quarter of it is fraudulent. That's a problem. That is a huge problem, you know, and it speaks to society in general. But how do you know that you're actually getting the skill set that you think you're hiring, especially if somebody's particularly adept in the interview process? Well, exactly. You know, the, 
the way I think about this is I think there, there are two types of folks that do really, really well in interviews. Folks who are genuinely qualified and folks who are really good at BSing. And we should we should weed that out, right? That shouldn't be okay. You know, I think it comes down to a couple of things. Number one, it just should be technologically impossible to fraudulently claim you have a credential. The technology exists. It's cheap. You know, th- that's solved. The other side, though, is like you say, which is like, well, maybe someone got the credential, but what what can they do? What does this actually mean? And I think then providing more data, more metadata, whether it's something as simple as syllabus attached to the credential, or it could be even more in-depth things like skill tagging, we can help to educate folks who are evaluating candidates, you know, on the recruitment side, to help them to make better decisions about, oh, okay, interesting. This is what this person can do. And I understand that, even if I'm not an expert in the field. That makes perfect sense to me. If a university were to take this on, which, you know, as we said, many of them have, the uh, the big challenge, I think, is going to be getting those course learning outcomes, getting the syllabi in there, and there's a role for the professor to be able to do that in this process. It, it, sound, it sounds like that would be the case, isn't it? That's right. You know, and so building a taxonomy of skills is a little bit of a holy grail and uh, can often feel intractable. So, you know, what we've seen a lot of organizations do is they don't try and do that for everything. They start just with one department. Often it's actually something like the business school and they'll sit down and they'll do their very, very best to figure out, look, how can we make our graduates look the very, very best that they can? What are we famous for, you know, in churning out our, our graduates in terms of the areas we focus on in employability? And how can we best communicate that on the credential? And that's the starting point of something like a taxonomy. And then what we often see is over the course of somewhere between sort of two to five years, that will spread <laughs> throughout the organization, you know, throughout the university from department to department. It's often led by professors just trying to do a better job of communicating w- what makes their students shine. And then essentially what we see is one or more than one taxonomy start to emerge. And it doesn't have to be perfect because you can change the taxonomies after the fact. But starting with something and starting small seems to actually have real dividends for, especially for, you know, if you're doing it one department at a time. And that makes sense from an entrepreneurial perspective is, you know, you establish your beachhead and then you start creating the demand when people start adapting those early adopters and, you know, Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm, you get those early adopters and all of a sudden it starts to take off and it's just it's wonderful when it happens and it can be infuriating to the entrepreneur because you don't necessarily have all the staffing to be able to do what's necessary. Well, let me tell you, I mean, that, that was a doozy in the early days. You know, we're, we're a decade in and for the first five years, we really struggled to get any customers. You know, I think we had like, I don't know, 10 after the first five years. Now, those 10 were really great. They were Google and uh, MIT and Berkeley, and but... It was so hard. We had to last for so long without salaries, you know, with a skeleton, a tiny little team. We, we, we had this, you know, fervent knowledge and belief that the market would be there for digital credentials. But I think one thing that was very difficult was I think we underestimated the conservatism in the early days of disrupting or, or innovating on something like credentialing. And, and, you know, if you think back, kind of rightfully so, this is not something you play with. This, this affects people's lives and it has to never fail. And, you know, luckily, I think we've, we've built up the infrastructure that, you know, I think it's sort of well proven now that we can issue millions and millions of credentials for all these amazing organizations. Um, and it basically just never fails. But in the early days, it was more about them taping a, taking a leap of faith. You know, you mentioned crossing the chasm. It wasn't so much around digitizing credentials or the technology. It was also around, well, will your company be here next year? You know, you're a tiny little startup. And, you know, we had to get to the point where we knew we would be, we got to profitability early and we knew we'd be around for a long time. And now, of course, we, it's not something we worry about. But what I think we first saw was, you know, in 20, sort of 15, 2016, we found the early adopters. We found the, the wonderful, crazy people who were not thinking purely <laughs> logically about, should I use this brand new technology um, for something as serious as credentials? But they were the innovators. They were the ones that proved it out. They did case studies on this. They did research on this. They they just tried. And thanks to them, because I don't think it made sense back then to do it. And now I think what we're seeing is the majority of organizations now are actually issuing digital credentials in one form or another, and it's become mainstream. You know, we've got large, you know, I can't, I can't mention all the names because we're under NDA, but we've got very large, very famous credentials that are about to imminently all go digital, ones that we're all very used to interfacing with. And I think that shows that now it's not an early adopter thing. Now it's actually a, 
you know, this is how credentials will be in the future. They will be digital. And there's less of the conservatism because so many amazing organizations have sort of gone and, and built that road for others to follow. Yeah, you're spot on with that and really glad that it's working out for you. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things we chatted about yesterday was the role of marketing in credentialing yeah. and yeah. how an institution really knows, needs to know what they do well. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, there's a few ways we can we can look at that. And, and I think that, you know, the, the marketing folks in organizations, there is a wee pricking up here because first and foremost, different institutions, you know, let's talk about higher education for, for now, you know, universities in particular, they know what they're really good at and what they're famous for. Some of them do, not not all of them for <laughs> sure. Well, that's true, especially as, as things evolve and, you know, especially in, 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 in more sort of sort of topics like computer science, which, you know, if frankly, the stuff I learned 10 years ago is probably all almost all like 90% will be obsolete. But, you know, some, some are very, True. very much focused on things like the higher level mathematics of, let's say, computer science, which is what I studied. I'm very familiar with it, which doesn't change a lot, you know, and some folks focus more on uh, engineering prowess. You know, hey, we churn out graduates who build scalable systems and they can write great code from day one versus, hey, we, we, we churn out graduates who actually are less strong on that, but have a very, very solid sort of mathematical understanding of how to write a really powerful algorithm or what sort of would be the key to making the next programming language. And so different, you know, that's just one degree, right? And so different organizations know, I think, often what they're really great at specializing in, but communicating that to the workforce and pairing up with employers that buy what they're selling, you know, I don't want to put too much of an economic lens because of course a huge part of the value is not is not just the economic side, is the creating a well-educated workforce and so on, but being able to communicate their style and how they do that, especially on the credential itself, is really important for the brand of the organization. There's another way of looking at this too, though, which is especially for the for-profit centers like the business schools or even non-university folks like, you know, Google, they're issuing literally millions of credentials a year. You know, Google are issuing these not to their employees, but for, for folks who, you know, they might have an entry-level computer science certification and then you can get the Google Cloud Platform specialization. And that's how you become a really great DevOps engineer, for example, or you might take the you know U.S. Road Laying Association specializations after having taken an engineering you know civil engineering degree. So the notion of being able to bundle these credentials together, and those folks you know also are trying to spread the word about hey you should learn about and take our courses. And one of the really powerful things about credentials, but especially digital credentials, is if folks get this credential as a digital thing, the first thing they do is they share it on their LinkedIn profile, and all their friends and all their colleagues you know they see that. And they're immediately thinking, huh, should I be doing that credential? Maybe I should click on that and learn more about it. And then you scroll down and you see all this metadata and you say, oh, that syllabus, I could do that. Wow, that salary, I'd like that. You know, and you know, so what you can see is you can make this movement of your graduates become this sort of advocacy for you in this really highly facilitated way by sharing things like credentials on your, whether it's your LinkedIn profile or often we see things like that on Instagram now or even in your email signature. That is interesting, and it brings a question to my mind is if someone, you know, let's just take your skill set as an entrepreneur who understands computer science, things like that. Mm. In your career, you're going to have certain skills that you build on. Can these credentials be customizable to focus on particular skills that would bring in both the university degree, other credentials, other specialized training, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we're seeing that all the time. And I think what's amazing is there's often a partnership between a higher education institution and a company like Google or a company like, you know, Marketo or even Slack, you know, where Slack, you might think, what on earth is Slack issuing credentials for? Slack being, of course, this very popular sort of uh, chat application for, for companies. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not training people in how to use Slack. They've spun up three career specializations. One of them, for example, is how to be a Slack certified integrations engineer. So if you work for a company that has two or 3,000 employees and they're using Slack, it's a person's, probably several people's full-time job just to integrate Slack with other platforms. You know, So you can see how, okay, wow, you've got this undergraduate degree, you've got this career specialization, and you're sort of adding to that and you're staying current You know, as technologies evolve and adapt over time. You can keep adding to your credentials. And I think what universities would love to be able to do is to bolster, to, to be able to add on these sort of add-on credentials to the degree in a way that feels compatible and keeps that degree relevant over time. So all of a sudden, yeah, my computer science degree, maybe maybe Java isn't the, the biggest programming language anymore, and that's what I used it when, when we were learning to code, but I can sort of supplement it with these new credentials as I grow throughout my career. And the university gets to play a part of that conversation 
instead of being just the foundational pillar where you then have to go and you know, on your own kind of figure out what to do, the university can sort of help to guide people throughout their careers to bolster their credentials over time. And you're seeing that with certain very progressive universities, such as Arizona State, who is preaching lifelong education and pulling in these kind of certificates, credentials, whatever, to be able to educate people for their entire life. Absolutely. And, you know, if you think of it, th- th- there's, there's a few sort of macro trends that I think make it really, really difficult for graduates. One of which is careers are getting horrifically specialized very, very, very quickly. If you look at the world of marketing, about a decade ago, so more like 15 years ago, I, I went back in and did some research on this, and there were nine types of marketing role that you might hire. Today, uh, there were over 53. Um, So it's not that you hire a marketing person, you hire a marketing automation specialist, right? Or a demand generation specialist or whatever it is, right? And the same is true for nursing. The same is true for pretty much any career. Your degree is no longer sufficient to make a full hiring decision. It is a foundation. It's a very important foundation in most cases, but it's just a foundation now. And I think universities that help to communicate the value of that foundation and then also help you find your specialization. How intimidating must it be if you want to be a marketer to figure out, well, which of those 53 should I put my hat on? You know, and that's that's my next decade of my life. You know, help them to make sort of informed decisions based on data. That might be economic data. It might be satisfaction data. It might be other types of data. But instead of shooting from the hip about how you want to spend your next decade, can we, can organizations like universities help folks to really lean in on that career advice and then attach that to something like a credential, which therefore increases the currency of your existing credentials and then gets you placed in a job. Mm -hmm. And as, you know, listeners will hear from another podcast coming up shortly about how the, the focus of education is changing from just providing a credential to providing a job and the training to ensure that you get a job This seems right in line with with what that is. Well, absolutely. And I think, you know, talking about credentials, you know, an internship is a credential. Um, That should, Mm -hmm. if you can do an internship, like I know, for example, that Notre Dame sends a troop of folks over to Silicon Valley every year, you know, to get them into companies like, you know, Meta and Google and others to just see how things are done. And that's a credential that should be added to the degree as its own standalone thing. And on that credential itself, It shouldn't just simply be, oh, yeah, I did this internship at Google or wherever. You know, it should be, and this is what I did. This is what I built. This is what I learned. Here are the skills. This is what my manager said of me, you know, and and provide. There's so much information that we hemorrhage, whether it's about, you know, someone who goes through, let's say, a four-year degree. What do we do? We summarize that into, if you're lucky, maybe what, like 15 GPAs. (laughs) And if you're unlucky, just one GPA. We hemorrhage all that information about you and we, we put you into this tiny little low resolution bucket. And I think we can do a much better job without throwing the baby you know, out with the bathwater. I, I think you're absolutely right. So tell me about the future of the credentialing industry. I mean, with so many different things going on, I, I mean, it's got to be not only complex, but really exciting. I think it is. I think first and foremost, I think the world is going digital and this is no exception. And there are huge low hanging fruit ways we can improve people's lives by providing contextual metadata on credentials in a much higher resolution way. And like you said, we've crossed the chasm. It's no longer, God bless them, the crazy early adopters that I wouldn't be here without. It's mainstream now. (laughs) Right, you know, and, and, and actually a statistic I can share with you that sort of might hammer that in is that, you know, in the early days, of course, like literally every single customer that we got, we had to go out there, pound the pavement and educate the market, tell them what digital credentials were. They didn't even know about them, of course, because we invented them and and then convince them to to, to consider adopting them. Now, 95% of our customers that we, we end up joining us, 95% come to us because either a competitor is doing it or, you know, because they saw it at a conference and they know that this is the future. So it's very much mainstream. And I think that, That's going to be a huge part. But also, I think it's going to be, there will be conglomerates of, might be higher education institutions, it might be companies, it might be nonprofits, it might be professional associations. I think we're going to see credentials being bundled together in a really powerful way. And we're going to have synergy from that. I think that employers will start to express, hey, we're looking for this and this type of candidate. 
then I think organizations like universities will be able to say, great, okay, well, we're going to bundle all these credentials for you. And, and, you know, I think we'll get to the point where we'll be so confident on the data behind these credentials that we'll be able to say things like, hey, well, actually, if you study this combination of credentials, you will be able to get a median salary in your sector or your money back. I think we'll be able to have the data to be able to underwrite, you know, and essentially, in most cases, guarantee outcomes. Or in the cases where we can't guarantee them because we don't have enough data, we can at least communicate that to folks and say, well, look, actually, maybe you want to consider this alternative specialization or, you know, you want to consider this alternative pathway. And I think that we'll we'll evolve away from uh, what most people do is for the second biggest expense in their life after buying a house, which is often education, they'll be shooting from the hip less about whether it's ROI in terms of money or ROI in terms of satisfaction. And they'll be making a lot more qualitative, informed decisions about what pathways they want to pursue. I see it changing the entire hiring industry. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that not least of which we won't be worried about, is this a fraudulent credential? Because by the way, those statistics we said before, those were resumes submitted to a background check. What's that number on LinkedIn? (laughs) You know, where there's no no scrutiny and it's not designed to have scrutiny, you know? And so, yeah, I think that companies like Credible will be verifying these things silently behind, behind the scenes. You know, we'll be, you'll think of us like a, you know, a Visa or a MasterCard. We're not the bank, we're the, with a layer in between that sort of guarantees the transaction, you might say, in air quotes. But also I think that there'll be a lot less guesswork about, hey, where should I study? How should I study? Or who should I employ? When should I employ them? I think that there'll be a lot more data to make more informed decisions. And something like a a digital credentialing infrastructure is, in my opinion, a a pretty serious prerequisite for that. I, I think you're absolutely right. Well, this has been fascinating. And as always, the time just goes by so quickly. So Danny, three takeaways for higher ed presidents and boards. Yeah, I think the first takeaway I'd like to have folks consider is how can you make your students look the very best that they can? And I don't think that's a one size fits all credential or transcript of records. If two students with the same grade look the same, I think that's a problem. And I think we could do something about that. So I would encourage folks to start thinking about what, what extra contextual information do we want to be sharing with stakeholders? Stakeholders may be an employer, it may be another university, you know. Um, the second thing I would say is I believe that digital credentialing is already mainstream and folks that are struggling with how to figure out the pedagogy around things like digital credentialing, there's a lot of help for you. You know, obviously, I'd love it if you came and talked to us at Incredible, but also there are literally researchers who now research the best ways to use micro-credentials, stack credentials, digital credentials, and all types of and, and, and forms. There are a lot of frameworks out there you can use, and I'd heavily encourage you to, to look into those. And then finally, I would I would think about the evolution of a person's career. You know, I think that many, like you say, initially at progressive institutions like ASU, but also I think it's becoming more and more mainstream, universities want to have a, a real relationship with graduates throughout their career. And I think something like, you know, having an ASU branded certificate wallet that folks want to add to that over time, even with non-ASU credentials, what, how can you maintain that relationship over time and then provide real value in terms of, for example, career guidance based on data? I think that would be hugely needle moving for the alumni relationship. So I think those are probably the three things that I would encourage folks to think about. Oh, those are great takeaways. Thank you. So what's next for you? What's next for Credible? Well, for me personally, I, I'm here to stay. I love, I love being in, in Incredible and, uh, you know, the company's growing like gangbusters. And uh, so for me, I think what's next for me is more of the same. I think the last 10 years, we went from a, a fledgling little baby company to, you know, we're 100 people now. We've got 1,850 happy paying customers. We've got 53 million credentials issued. And, and that number's roughly doubling, a little more than doubling year on year. So I want to keep doing that. And I think that what that looks like next is, As this becomes mainstream, I think Credible can really become a force for good in the world for helping folks to understand which credentials lead to which outcomes and how to discover new educational opportunities based on the credentials they already have or based on their goals. You know, being able to bridge, help folks with that career advice. I think that's what we're really excited about. That's for me personally and for the company in general, I think we're, we're really poised to grow. You know, we're profitable, raise some rounds of funding from VCs as well. And for us, I think it's going to be not necessarily, you know, how do we become a household name, but more, how can we really sort of underpin and uh, become the infrastructure for the world's credentials in a way that eliminates fraud and maximizes the ability to make smart decisions with your education and your career? 
Oh, very good. Danny, thank you so much for being a guest. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and wish you guys there at Incredible all the best. Well, thank you so much. It was such a blast to talk to you and really great to connect with you and really appreciate the opportunity to be on the, on the podcast. Our pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for listening today and a special thank you to this week's guest, Danny King from Accredible, and for his sharing his with us how they are changing transcripts and credentials and the way they're being used by higher education institutions and employer. Thanks, Danny. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Our next podcast is our traditional end of the year with yours truly and Deb Maui, TCL's marketing expert and positioning teammate. Please join us to ring in the new year with our look back at 2022 and our prognostications for 2023. On a more personal note, we at The Change Leader thank you for your support over 2022 and for the previous four years we've been doing this podcast. We look forward to the next few years of doing these and the supplying you with more podcasts and other thought leadership pieces. Happy New Year, everyone. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show, and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.